Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Christoph Stuckerberger. I'm a professor of ethics in Geneva, Switzerland, but also teaching in Africa, in Nigeria, in Russia, in China, and in many countries for lectures. It's my great pleasure to be with you on this important topic on cultivate and conserve towards a sustainable development paradigm. How can we find values which contribute to these societies which are committed to sustainability, to long-term uh, survival and impact in a positive way on human lives and on nature. And how can we do that from an ethical perspective? That's the topic of today. Next, the content you see what are our values and what can we do as the two main chapters? So first we need to know what are our benchmarks, what is our vision, what are our dreams? And then, uh, of course, we want to ask what can we do? Because ethics is not about theories, as many people think. Ethics is about action. Ethics is about practical orientation in decision making and in implementation of decisions. Next one. I like to start with my own journey because that gives you probably a bit of a, a view on where I'm coming from. I published after theological studies just as at the end my first book on sustainable development in fact uh, about a new lifestyle and about what we call human-centered growth or growth with a human face. It was the time in the 70s when 1972 the Club of Rome published the first book Limits to Growth which was like a bomb uh, coming to uh, shake our, us and we as students were very much aware of this uh, in the time of the oil crisis but how can we now um, have a growth which serves human lives and does not destroy environment? That was my first book in, in 1977, so 30 years ago, uh, no, 40 years ago. And uh, now uh, one of the last one, uh, a compilation of global ethics applied, one volume, there's not volume two is on environmental ethics. So you see, I try since 40 years to deal with this question. And I must say that now with age, we see that uh, the urgency is not decreasing on the country. We need to find solutions for this question. Um, Non-renewable energy, is a key issue and I made a calculation already decades ago where I became aware that even at the age of 30 I already used the amount of uh, as a normal middle-class European I used the amount of energy which was my share if you look at the non-renewable energy of oil gas uh, coal um, and the rest so that means that we all live beyond our uh, share that we should have if we look at the total amount of non-renewable energy and divide it by the population and say we all should have equal access and e equal rights. So that makes me nervous to see that we really have to act. Also one personal question is the family issue. We have four children and some people say, oh, we should not have children because they also have their footprint. So four times more footprint than my own and of my wife. So is it ju still justified? But I think, yes, it is. We need children, we need future, and we need people who are ready to contribute to the future um, of our planet. And uh, for example, two of them, they studied physics in uh, improving solar energy efficiency. Uh, so these are positive aspects 
even though we all need to do our own contribution for the reduction of our footprint, of our environmental footprint. Next one. Now, pessimism, optimism and hope is the title of the slide 1.2. Many people are really pessimistic because they see the environmental destruction uh, in a huge dimension, climate change, water crisis, uh, the changes are too slow, so we could be despaired. But then the optimists on the other side, they see the great progress in global poverty reduction. Imagine when I was a student, we had the information that millions of people in India will die in the year 2000 because of hunger crisis. That was in the 70s. Today, India can be a food exporter. There is still hunger, but there is so much progress around the world in so many aspects, education, health, uh, access to water, and so on. So there is a lot of um, progress and the optimists would say, look at these positive results. The realists as the third category of people would say, we see the positive and the negative side. We are not one-sided, but all these three options the pessimists, the optimists, and the realists, they look at what they see, what they get as information from the scientists, from the media, what they experience themselves by walking through the forest or by seeing the destruction of the earth. But there is another view of reality, and that is the faith view, or the values view, we could also say. Faith believer say, we are not referring only to what we see, but what we believe. What is the promise for this earth? Let's take the Christian background as an example. Even if I am a pessimist, when I look at reality, I see that the changes are not fast enough, the destruction is going on, and still I would call myself a realist full of hope. We are pessimistic, optimist, but I am still full of hope and hope is a category which is beyond what I see. It's what I hope. That means what I see as promise in the Christian tradition, the promise of God that this earth shall not be destroyed a second time after uh, Noah disaster. So let us walk on that and I start with that in my lecture because I see that even if you have all the information but if we are not able to activate our energy to do something then we are not changing the world. So this question of what is the motivation and the energy motor to do something is a key question in ethics. I would sum up this point uh, with a saying, I do not give up, I count also on you, all those now in this virtual classroom. We together are few, but we can make a difference. Next slide. So let us now coming to come to the sustainability topic. People think, oh, sustainability, that's complex or abused as a word, as a word, everybody's talking about it. I have a very simple uh, definition. Sustainable equal to cultivate and to conserve. I could call it the CC definition, cultivate and conserve. That's not, not my invention. It's the oldest definition of sustainability I found and also the shortest one. Two words only. Let us see at the text in Genesis 2.15 in the Bible. God took the man, man or woman, and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and to conserve it. This is the oldest text, almost 3,000 years old, uh, and the, even older than the first chapter, uh, the first uh, creation story in the Bible. So this, to, conserve, to cultivate and conserve means we have the right, we have even the obligation 
to do agriculture, to increase uh, food security, to produce more if there are more people, and uh, to use technology to improve lives, to use education, to be knowledgeable about how to live our lives in society. All this means to cultivate. But this is sustainable only if we're able to combine it with conservation. That means to conserve. That means to, to maintain what we have, not to use the resources without renewing the resources. That is the whole issue of sustainability. And now how to balance, to change the world in order to have a better life and to survive uh, each in individual. And on the other hand, how can we do it with having a better uh, conservation or sustainability? Next slide. <clears throat> now, in the Abrahamic tradition, we can include the Jewish, the Christian, and the Muslim, because this truth is not only the Christian one, it's shared by the Jewish and the Muslim. This is difficult for human beings to keep together. And that's our, I would call, our original sin. God the Creator, for Him, the will, and the action is one. There's not, I want to do, but I cannot do. God said in the creation story, there will be light, and there was light in the same second. That means for God, there's no separation, and also no separation between create and conserve. That's one. And that's the tragedy of us as human beings, that we separate these two things. We have difficulties to unite it and to combine it. I think it's similar in the Eastern religions. If we look at the Dharmaic religions, as we call them, Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, and others, uh, who say, yes, we need to shift from the egoistic, way, the ego to the self, we need to find the inner truth, the real human being that we are or should be. And then we are able to combine the cultivate and conserve aspect. Next one. Now, <clears throat> if you look at values, cultivate and conserve, that means freedom and responsibility. We have the freedom to cultivate. We have the freedom for technology. Technology is not evil on the country. This is a, a gift that we have. We have the talents, the intelligence to use even in artificial intelligence to develop robots, to develop uh, um, better efficiency in solar energy and all the rest. That's a big gift. And we have the freedom to use it. But there is a but only as far as we are able to use it in a responsible way. We are not unlimited in our freedom. Even freedom of research. And many of you uh, listening to this lecture are in academic world. We are researchers. We do research and we have the freedom of research and we need it. But we need to do it in a responsible way. That means <clears throat> we see the limitations and the limitation is we have to develop inventions and innovations in a way which have a clear contribution to sustainability. If it's not sustainable, it's not an ethical innovation. So cultivate the earth for a living with agriculture, with science and technology, with social and political structures, that's also innovation to have new forms of community, of uh, living together, of state organization, but only as far as we are able to use not more than it uh, is the renewable energy, 
with my maintaining biodiversity and also that of course includes then recycling, carbon stability and all the rest that you know. Next one. Now there is one in important dimension on, of sustainability. That's the timeline. Sustainability cannot mean we are just looking at the generations who live now. The 8 billion people is already a lot. But we look in the timeline. We are coming from the past and we are going to the future. Former generations helped or destroyed the environment. Future generations will do the same. So we have a gen the, uh, solidarity between generations. Means sustainability is intergenerational. I have this, this definition of sustainability, which is a bit more complex than the short one on conserve and cultivate. Sustainable development enables a life in dignity of present generations, of human and of non-human beings, without endangering a life in dignity of future generations of human and non-human beings. This uh, means that we have a um, definition which says we have to look at first the generations which leave and the generations does not mean only the human generations we look for the survival of uh, our brothers and sisters uh, as human beings sustainability means we cannot survive as humanity if uh, it's detached from na nature from plants and animals we are an ecosystem and together we have to look for survival. There is no separation where we can say we can survive on the back of destruction of plants and animals. And then the future generations are included. We cannot survive if we use all the non-renewable energies today without having a access for the future generations. That's why we have to limit our access to resources in order to leave something for the future generations. Now let us look at the next one, 2.5. Sustainability ethics is holistic. That means sustainability is something which goes across all the different um, topics. Sustainability has a business aspect, so sustainable companies, sustainable business, sustainable economy, then sustainable technology, sustainable environment, sustainable politics, how to organize a human society in a political sense, which is sustainable, sustainable communities, and I include even sustainable spirituality. We all know today that technology alone cannot solve the problems. We need technology, no doubt. But if this technology is not rooted in values, in a view, a spiritual view of humility, what we are as human beings in the whole of the creation, then technology runs in the wrong direction. Then we just run behind new fashion, self-driving cars and robots as teachers and whatever fashion we see, new mobile phone generations. But if it's not rooted in this conviction that we are a modest part of the whole earth and the whole universe, then technology will be destructive in order uh, um, and not constructive. Let us come back now to one in the next slide, to one aspect. I say freedom and responsibility have to be together. Now, what is responsibility? It's not so complicated. If you look at the word itself, there are different uh, interpretations of the Latin word respondere. There is uh, one interpretation says it means respondere, that means to give enough emphasis on the public issues of the common goods we would call it today. But I have another interpretation, respondere, 
Spondere means the sponsor, to sponsor. Now, in, re, in ethical terms, it means there is a sponsor of this earth. We are not the creator of the earth. There is a creation energy which created this wonderful world. And this world is sponsored in religious terms. We would say God sponsored the earth, the creation, and gave it to humanity for responsible use. Now, re means back, giving back, or also to respond. The word respond, répondre in French, uh, means to give back, to respond to the sponsor. So responsibility is a relational issue. There is somebody who gives me something and I give back in the way I use this gift. That's the whole idea of stewardship, of responsibility. And that is key. If we talk about sustainability, that means we behave in a way that our earth is not, we are not the owners of it. We are the stewards. We are the managers. We are entitled to use it, but not to abuse it. That's the, the key of responsibility. And this fact, and this we see in the next slide, 3.2, is something which is common across cultures, across religions. That's what we call the golden rule. You see here a picture which shows the golden rule of mutuality or reciprocity. It's known and supported in all world religions and world views. You can find it in Confucian, the text of Confucius. You can find it in the Bible. You can find it in the Bhagavad Gita. You can find it in the Tao Te Ching of the Taoism, um, and so on. So what does it mean? It means we do not do to others what we don't want them to do to us, or positively said, do to others what you expect from them to do to you. This is mutuality, and that is responsibility. So if we don't want that the others destroy the earth because uh, that would har do harm to us, then we should do the same. We should not destroy our living basis because we destroy the other's life and at the end our own. So this golden rule is a simple and universal rule across cultures and religions, which is also a basis for sustainability in ethical terms. I come back to this ownership also. You see it on the slide, the responsible person acts not as owner, but as caretaker of entrusted goods and goods as good stewards. There's a very simple and very impressive short story in the Bible of the good and the bad manager. The good manager abuses the employees, pays not the salaries, um, abuses the natural resources, and the good manager works hard, uh, keeps uh, the trust of the employees, pays the salaries and maintains the natural resources. So it's as simple as that. Stewardship, responsibility, sustainability are three words which belong together, which are one same ethical direction. Now, let me come to the next one. If we talk about sustainability, sustainability, stewardship and responsibility, I would like to add another word, a virtue. We could also call it a value. And I call it the one character revolution. It's the paradigm shift from the me to the we. It's again the same notion that I mentioned already. Sustainability means we cannot think only of my interest, my profit, my benefit, if we do need not think about the effect on the community. In English it works, I say from the me to the we. If you imagine the M and you turn it down 
up uh, down then it becomes a w that's what i call the one character evolution so you see we need to come to a view where we have this shift in our thinking not what can i get what can i earn more how can i use more energy how can i have a better life but how can we together come to that only then we are sustainable and can survive as humanity and i think we know it all but we have to remind and we have to be reminded by our fellows in the next slide you see what it means this shift from the me to the we means really we look in our institution is it a university is it a company is it a public administration is it a family we look not only about my power my benefit but the we on the right side of this slide you see a tree which is i call it a rotten tree or a dead tree you have roots like mistrust power manipulation personal interests and this leads to um, then not really fruits if you have mistrust in the roots you have mistrust as fruits and that's not a fruit in the positive sense you have abuse of resources you have absolute loyalty if uh, you fear to have a good team because you only think of how can i have a better uh, power situation and power, uh, power concentration on in myself then you try to divide your staff to uh, you create all kind of conflicts that's not a fruitful way but if you look at the left side i call it the integrity leadership you have trust competent people integrity yourself you look for the common good for honesty this integrity tree then bears a lot of fruits and this is key for sustainability much of the destruction of this earth and much of the conflicts come from the right side tree i call it call it a corrupt system corrupt in now in the large sense of rotten not not life uh, enhancing position and attitude but the good tree the growing tree is based on competence you have the best staff that you employ that you can find you uh, ask for performance you trust the people you set rules and controls even self control of the leader the leader needs a superior counsel or to control even the president of a university or the ceo of a company so this integrity system then allows prosperous sustainable development by the way all what they say about sustainability is of course in the frame also of the united nations sustainable development goals the sdgs the 17 goals which humanity we could say the coalition of states all states of the world united in the united nations de decided in 2015 for the period 2015 to 2030 a huge achievement to have 17 goals together and so many millions of institutions and persons who now work on implementing it let me just show you i visited recently uh, a week ago the general secretary of the united nations in geneva he gave me his pin that's the pin of the sustainable development goals you see the 17 colors as 17 goals united in one uh, pin so that means whenever we walk look at sustainability we do it not in an abstract philosophical sense we do it in relation with the concrete uh, goals of humanity broken down to uh, no hunger uh, better education and all the rest now 
what to do in addition to this integrity. I use another one, reduce complexity and increase proximity. I think one big problem we have in today's world, let's first say the chance is we are united, interconnected in a globalized world with our uh, mobile phones, with our internet. We have so many chances, but I think more and more people feel helpless in that. This complexity leads to a lot of problems. We have a, such a complexity that it can be abused for cybercrime. It uh, can lead to collapse of financial systems because the financial interactions are not transparent enough, even with our new transparency um, uh, standards. So reducing complexity and increasing proximity. Proximity means human interaction. I don't want to chat only with a computer or with a, with a robot. I want to chat with my wife and with human beings around me, with friends. This makes the dignity and the joy of human life. So we need a sustainable development which is also still based on direct human interaction. Less technology related human interaction but direct interaction we are now on a on a virtual campus with a virtual lecture that's fine and i enjoy it to be in touch with you on this level but of course we all know we would die if we would communicate only in this way we need the direct interaction and you see it in the photo here by entrepreneurs and philanthropists and uh, project uh, responsible people are interacting with children. Another point of what to do in terms of sustainability is robots for jobs, not replacing relations. It's, again, it's about relations. We see now in a fast speed, robots coming in for jobs, uh, to replace jobs, robots to um, bank services, robots to even teaching in classrooms, robots everywhere as uh, view, seen as the big future. But robots may help and robots are already meaningful in many parts. I'm not against robots, but robots cannot replace human relations. I don't want to have a bank relation with my bank through a robot. The robot may even give better advice than a human being in terms of uh, mathematical um, formula about investments or whatever. But that's not enough. So let's come back to some fundamentals. Human development and growth with a human face means the human being is still the center of development. And we should uh, remind ourselves again and again on that. The same with innovation. We all speak about innovation. Everybody who wants to get money, a startup, um, um, a research institute at the university needs to show that they, we are innovative. Innovative is very important. And without innovation, a country cannot prosper. But we should again be realistic not every innovation is positive we have positive and ne negative innovation if you invent a new chemical substance to kill people uh, faster or to have a new uh, arm to shoot uh, to shoot somebody with this uh, little pen and to develop this pen to an arm is that an ethical innovation it may be seen as an innovation if this becomes an arm, to sh a gun. But that is not an ethical innovation because we are not here to kill each other. We are here to heal each other. So that's why you see on this slide 6.1, ethical inno innovation for sustainability. An ethical innovator has sustainability as the goal. 
and I don't go through the list of the, the 11 for time reasons, but you can uh, see these slides after again. An ethical innovator is, for example, you see, if you look at the red one, inclusive, for the benefit of deprived and needy and not for the benefit only of a small luxury class. I don't say that the luxury watch of Geneva is, is, not, is bad. No, it's, a, it's part of life. But what really makes the difference also for the sustainable development goals is to have an innovation which helps to settle the basic challenges of humanity, reduce poverty, increase access to education, um, increase uh, access to uh, drinking water and this uh, to health and all, all that. Improving living conditions, income generating, I want to just refer to the last one. Innovation which kills only jobs and does not create new jobs is not an ethical innovation. Jobs creation is one of the greatest challenges of humanity. We have millions of jobless graduates even among the listeners here, we may have young graduates who are jobless. What is the meaning then of education if it's not enabling to find an income through a paid job or a startup or whatever activity leads to a human living? Let me come to the next one, which is also an important part of sustainability. The investments are huge in the world, trillions and trillions of dollars. But where to invest in order to have a sustainable investment? So we call it the impact investments now. We have to shift the investments from just speculative investments to investments in sustainability. And a lot of developments are going on in that sustainable funds, um, impact investing in a very positive way. But we are not yet where we have to be. And the UN, if you look again at, at this uh, sustainable development, the, go, the, the U, United Nations tell us clearly from the, I don't remember how many billion, trillion of dollars we need from 2015 to 2030 to reach the development goals. 70% has to come from the investment sector. The public uh, development cooperation is needed, the private donations are needed, the NGOs, the development agencies, all that is needed, but it's not enough. We need huge money, investment money, driven to sustainable investments. Let me come to another aspect of what to do when we talk about how to reach a sustainable development in an ethical way. Regulations and sanctions for sustainability. I have a simple observation, which of course is also rooted in my ethical value system and in the question, what are we as human beings? We are genius, we can do so much good but we are also weak. As I said, we cannot really have bridged the gap between uh, what we want to do and what we really do. We are always behind in our action, behind the good intention. We also remain short-term oriented, even if I think I want to, to care for grandchildren and for future generations and for the next century. At the end of the day, our decisions are, are made in order to survive for the next two weeks and to care for this and that. So we have these weaknesses. And we need communities to help us. My family members, uh, friends, uh, colleagues at university or in the company or in the NGO. We need these commu our, our religious communities in the church, in the, in the mosque, communities to help each other in sustainability. We need to encourage each other. We need to remind each other, oh, but my friend uh, Christoph, you said this and this, please uh, remain on track. 
I need this kind of encouragement. And second, we need regulations and laws to push for sustainable behavior. Regulations is not just uh, police to sanction us and to give us a bad conscience or whatever. Laws, rules and regulations, courts, police, they should help us and they do in order to respect the rules of sustainability. That means if we destroy and pollute the water against the law, the factory will be closed or the polluter will be brought to court. And we should not see that as something negative to avoid. No, we need this help in order to behave in an ethical way. That's also why law and ethics are twins. Law needs ethical values, of course. Every law is based on some values, or has to be. But ethics leads also the law to enforce ethical behavior. We are too weak to just uh, a good, good, good uh, will and good intention is not enough. Laws and sanctions and regulations help us to implement what we want to do and need to do. So sanctions means in order to enforce regulations. And I come to the second last uh, slide almost. I give the title on uh, Inner Transformation for Sustainability. Transformation in the world and inner spiritual transformation have to go hand in hand. When I was young, I painted this little just a simple uh, drawing, the risk, the vulnerability of our life is uh, visible here. And we need something which gives us the inner stability and the inner consciousness and the inner peace and also the keeping track with our vision and dreams. And when we are centered in that inner spiritual way, then we can be sustainable. Sorry. Um, we can then be sustainable in our behavior. So faith and spirituality are drivers of transformation, as I call it. They are not something to escape. Some people use religion and meditation as escapism, to escape from this uh, reality. No, it's the opposite, sorry. Uh, it's the opposite. The inner transformation and spirituality helps us to be with both feet on our earth and to be with both feet engaged and have the energy and the motivation to transform this world. I quote Doug Hammarskjöld on the next slide, the Secretary General of the United Nations 1953 to 61 and he died in a car in a crash of a, on an airplane in Congo in 61. He said the journey to the inner world is a longer journey. So to develop this inner energy, this strength, these values of integrity, of no corruption, of no nepotism, of caring for the community and not only for the, for the own uh, benefit, all this is a long inner process. And I would like to encourage all of us to care for that and to be able to, to be strong and to resist also all kind of temptations of just playing around in this world in order to really become human beings like Gandhi, like Mandela, like so many uh, in this world who were able to have based on their inner values a real long-term impact on sustainability. I think if we do that, then uh, we can make a real difference. So I count on every of you and myself. I wish you a courageous, joyful, I would call it sustainability journey. Let's keep in touch in that effort for a common, sustainable world. Thank you so much. <laughs>